Hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Mike Lazaridis Theatre of Ideas here at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And welcome to the Perimeter Public Lecture Series presented by Sun Life Financial. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the Director of Educational Outreach here at Perimeter and it is a sincere pleasure to welcome everyone here today. Both those of you here in the in-studio live audience and those of you watching online in either Perimeter's website or one of our many science communication colleagues' websites around the globe. The lecture itself will last approximately one hour and it will be followed by a question and answer session. For those of you that are watching online, Dr. Damien Pope and Dr. Kelly Foyle and a team of PI researchers are behind their keyboards in the chat zone ready to engage in conversation throughout the lecture. If you want to participate in those discussions, use hashtag PI Live. And I will also take a question or two from the Twitter feed at the end. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's very special guest speaker, one of Perimeter's own, a faculty member, Dr. Kendrick Smith. Kendrick's research tackles some of the most enduring questions of humanity. How did the universe begin? What is it made of? How does it work? Dr. Smith is a data-oriented cosmologist whose work is a mixture of theoretical physics, computational physics, statistics, phenomenology, and data analysis. He has been a key member in world-leading experiments, including WMAP and Planck satellites, which map the earliest light of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, to stunning precision. He and the WMAP team earned the 2012 Gerber Prize, Cosmo the Gerber Cosmology Prize, which recognizes researchers whose groundbreaking work provides new models and inspires and enables new knowledge and even culture. He has earned PhDs in both mathematics and physics. He completed postdoctoral positions at Cambridge University and at Princeton. And then in 2012, Dr. Kendrick Smith became a faculty member here at Perimeter. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Kendrick Smith. Welcome. Thanks very much. All right, thanks everyone for coming out in a snowstorm to hear about my favorite subject, cosmology. Uh, so if you were an astronomer a thousand years ago, your picture of the universe would look something like this. Uh, the Earth is at the center of the universe, uh, followed by the seven planets, uh, which are the Moon, Mercury, uh, Venus. The fourth planet is, of course, the Sun, then Jupiter, Saturn, and then the firmament, which is a big, opaque, solid sphere surrounding the Earth with little pinpricks, which are the stars. If you were an astronomer a hundred years ago, your picture would be very different. Uh, glossing over a lot of history, there followed a sequence of historical developments which slowly took the Earth out of the center of the universe and also made the Earth universe a much larger place. The Earth is one of several planets orbiting the Sun, which is one of many stars in the galaxy, which is one of many galaxies in a very large universe separated by vast amounts of empty space. The 21st century picture of the universe is actually pretty different from this. We know a lot more than we did 100 years ago or even 30 years ago, but the picture is hard to summarize in a picture because it involves a lot of unfamiliar physics concepts. So it'll take some time to explain. In the next hour, I'll summarize our modern understanding of cosmology, which includes not only a new picture of the universe, but also answers to some of the oldest, most self-motivating questions in science, like how did the universe begin, what is it composed of, and how will it end? Uh, the talk will have three parts. In the first uh, part, I'll talk about the expanding universe. Uh, so before I get into the big picture, I want to talk about something specific and technical. You're probably familiar from everyday experience with the Doppler effect for sound waves. Uh, a moving source of sound, say a siren on a am moving ambulance, uh, if the motion is toward the listener, then the listener will perceive the sound at a higher pitch because the wave fronts bunch up and the apparent wavelength is shorter, or the equ equivalently the apparent frequency is higher. Likewise, a receding uh, source of sound is perceived at a lower pitch. There's also a Doppler effect for light, but you wouldn't be familiar with it unless you're an astronomer. Uh, the, in order for it to be large enough to be noticeable, the speeds involved have to be an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. An object which is moving, say, away from a viewer emitting light uh, is seen with the light at a lower frequency or a redder color and a, a source which is emitting light and moving toward an observer is seen with a bluer color. 
In both the sound and light cases, it's the frequency that's shifted by the relative motion, but uh, frequency of sound is what we perceive as pitch, and frequency of light is what we experience as color. Next, I want to tell you about a revolutionary discovery made by the astronomer Edwin Hubble in 1929. What Hubble was trying to do is what nowadays we would call a redshift survey. So here's the idea. Here's Hubble with his telescope. Uh, I have a low-budget way of making slides that involves a lot of Google image search. Uh, he looks out and sees a galaxy, uh, and he measures the redshift. Say this one is blue, it has a small blue shift. Uh, by the Doppler effect, that can be translated into a measurement of its velocity, since it's blue shifted, uh, in the direction of the Earth, at, by, by some definite amount, say 100 kilometers per second. Uh, here's another one, it's red, and the red shift can be, trans can be measured and translated to uh, some uh, recessional velocity, say 200 kilometers per second. Uh, the Doppler shift can be measured um, very accurately using uh, spectrographs, uh, and so we can measure very accurately the component of the velocity which is either toward us or away from us. The tangential or side-to-side -side component of the velocity, by the way, is much harder to measure, but we can get an incomplete picture, a partial picture, of how um, the galaxies are moving around relative to each other. So this is what Hubble was trying to do. That's was the idea of his redshift survey. And uh, when Hubble made his observations, here's what he found. Nearby galaxies are equally likely to be blue-shifted or red-shifted, i.e. moving toward us or away from us, but as you go further out, there's a statistical tendency for galaxies to be redshift, redshifted, which increases, and the characteristic redshifts get larger as you go further away. Uh, now, this was a total shock and difficult to interpret. It's as if uh, we're, we sit in the center of the universe and all the galaxies in the universe are receding away from us by an amount, by a velocity of recession that just gets larger and larger as we go further away. Now, Hubble didn't know it at the time, but the... Um, Physics theoretical framework for interpreting his observations had been put forward a few years before. In 1915, Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity according to which distances and times are dynamical quantities. I'll explain shortly exactly what that means. And he proposed a set of equations for predicting in various circumstances how those dynamical distance and distances and times would evolve with time. When Einstein's equations are applied to the universe as a whole, they predict an expanding universe. Uh, now, Einstein famously regarded this as a failure of his theory and even tried to doctor up his own equations to get rid of this prediction. Uh, and it took these physicists, uh, Friedman, a Russian physicist who was the first, uh, but died shortly after um, publishing his work, uh, and this Belgian um, astronomer and priest, you can see he's got a robe in the picture, uh, Lemaitre, who I think would be the first guy that really had the full modern picture of the expanding universe. He even uh, originated the Big Bang Theory, although he called it the Cosmic Egg Theory, which is an even more fun name. Uh, so here's what uh, relativity predicts. Here's what the expanding universe means. Uh, consider a hypothetical universe, the grid universe, in which all galaxies happen to sit at the vertices of a regular grid with some regular spacing of, say, a million light years and are at rest. Uh, in this grid universe, even though the galaxies are pulling on each other gravitationally, there's no net motion in any particular direction because of the symmetry of this situation. This galaxy is pulled on equally hard by all of its neighbors and so it doesn't move. Uh, likewise for every other galaxy. And so you might think that the grid universe is a rather boring, static place, um, but in general relativity, there is one thing that happens, which is that if we measure the spacing of the grid at some later time, say 10 billion years later, uh, the spacing will have increased to, say, 2 million light years. So if we just take weight and take a ruler and measure, we get a different number. Uh, that's what we mean when we say the universe is expanding. Why does it expand? Uh, well, general relativity uh, is a proposal that distances are dynamical quantities that change, and a set of equations for predicting how they change, and the test of whether that idea is correct is whether it agrees with experiments. Now, a point I want to emphasize uh, is that, let me go back, the point that I want to emphasize is that there's no uh, center to the expansion. Um, if you consider how the expanding universe would look by an observer living in this galaxy, they see the distance to the neighboring galaxy increasing with time. So by, with the numbers from the previous slides, by say one million light years every 10 billion years, 
so some definite velocity, and a galaxy that was two positions over on the grid would be increasing at twice that velocity, and so on. So viewed from the perspective of any galaxy in the grid, it looks like you sit at the center of the universe with the other galaxies moving away from you, but there's no center to the expansion. What the expanding universe means is that the distance between any two points in the universe is just increasing with time. It's space itself that's expanding, and that statement can be made without reference to any particular center. So uh, this galaxy, if they observe, they'll see exactly the same picture. Um, now, Hubble's observations are nearly the same universe. The only difference is that, of course, in the real universe, the galaxies don't live on the vertices of a regular grid, and there's also some random scatter on top of the uniform recession because uh, the galaxies move around and say, uh, maybe this pair of galaxies is a binary system where they're, they're or orbiting each other, and this galaxy just happens to be moving toward us, and this galaxy just happens to be moving away from us, and those so-called peculiar velocities add random scatter to the recession. But if we look far enough away, uh, they average down, and we see the uh, overall recession. Um, so this is a beautiful example in the history of physics of the intersection between theory and experiment. Einstein's theory made a very counterintuitive prediction, the prediction of an expanding universe. Uh, Hubble's experiment made a counterintuitive observation, and it turned out that the two linked together. Uh, Hubble's observations were uh, strong evidence in support of Einstein's theory. Uh, and Einstein's theory explains this counterintuitive picture that Hubble saw. Uh, in the next part of the talk, I'll talk about the cosmic microwave background. In the years following Hubble's discovery, physicists had a lot of time to think about the implications of an expanding universe uh, without having a lot of new observational input. Uh, as you'll see, if the idea of an expanding universe is taken to its logical conclusion, one can make some truly remarkable predictions. Uh, if, you ex if you imagine running the clock backward in, ex in an expanding universe, what that would mean is that as you run the clock backward, the distance between any two galaxies, say, is decreasing with time. You can run the clock back to a time when the distance between galaxies was equal to, say, the size of a galaxy itself, so they'd be touching, or 1 100th the size, so they would be 99% overlapping. At minimum, this, what this tells you is that the universe must have been very different in the far past than it appears today, where, uh, say, the stars in the universe are separated out into widely spaced uh, discrete galaxies. In fact, if you do the math, the equations of general relativ relativity predict a disaster. All distances go to zero, a finite time in the past. So there's some finite time in the past, which we now know to be about 14 billion years, when, if you just um, run the equations of general relativity backward in time, you would predict that the distance between any two points is zero, and everything is on top of everything else. Uh, now, at various points in the history of physics, when um, equations have predicted nonsense, that's always been a sign that our understanding is incomplete, and there are laws of physics we don't know about yet. And so the proper interpretation of this Big Bang, this Big Bang situation, is just that our understanding is incomplete and we can't make predictions arbitrarily uh, far into the past. It's not a prediction for any specific um, dramatic event that took place in the early universe. Uh, another implication, we'll come back to this later, uh, another implication of the expanding universe is that we don't live in a special place in the universe, but we do live in a special place in time. Uh, the ancient astronomers believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, and it was actually a, a, revolu a revolutionary discovery to learn otherwise. In the expanding universe, it's also true that we don't sit at the center, there's no special place, any, any two points in the expanding universe are equivalent, but the universe does evolve with time, and we do live at a special time between um, an early time where the universe was very small and looked very different from how it does today, and a late time when everything will be expanded very far away from everything else and the material to form new stars is extinguished. Uh, so this, I think, this statement is also, I think, a revolutionary discovery and a new picture. In fact, the evolution of, with modern data, which is much more powerful than what Hubble had, the evolution of the universe can be seen directly. Uh, here's a map of galaxies in, in the universe from a modern telescope, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, the Earth is at the center, and we can observe out to billions of light years away. Uh, the reason there's a cone geometry here, by the way, is that this experiment only measures part of the sky. If you map the whole sky, it would be like a circle. Um, 
A very important note on this picture. Uh, because uh, we can see billions of light years away, we also get to look uh, backward in time. If we observe a galaxy which is, say, two billion light years away, we don't see the galaxy as it is now, we see it as it was two billion years ago, because that's how long it took the light to get to us. Uh, so you get to uh, experience a form of time travel, whereas you look farther and farther out into the universe, you get to see the universe as it was longer and longer in the past. Uh, that's an important thing to remember. I'm going to show a lot of plots like this, and I've gotten so used to this idea that I tend to just automatically think of this axis interchangeably as either a distance that you're looking out or a time that you're looking back into the past. Um, anyway, we, you can see in data sets like this directly that the universe is evolving. If you look far enough away or equivalently far enough back, then you can see the characteristic properties of the galaxies, their sizes, shapes, rate of, rates of star formation, and so on changing. Uh, the idea that by looking far away we can look backward in time is a very powerful one in cosmology. In fact, I'll explain soon that there's a way we can look back almost all the way to the Big Bang. Uh, now, a concept that I'll talk about a lot is gravitational instability. Uh, this is just the idea that because gravity is an attractive force, it always makes the universe more structured with time. Uh, this is a computer simulation of, of gravitational instability operating in a cloud of gas. Initially, the only structure in this gas is that there are little, it's almost featureless, almost structureless, but there are little regions where it's, say, 1% more dense than average or less, or 1% less dense than average. Now, what will happen is that a little region, which is 1% more dense than average, will gravitate more strongly than its neighbors and will tend to pull gas in. Uh, this leads to a situation where the little region is 2% more dense than average, 3%, and so on, and the initial structure gets magnified by gravity. So when I start the movie, uh, the first thing that you'll see happen is that the gas is rapidly pulled into the initial overdense regions and little filaments connecting those regions. Uh, gravity next tries to structure things further by collapsing all the filaments together into a little sheet. And then as you watch, you can see a little point-like uh, structure start to develop in the center here. Uh, this structure is getting larger because it's fed by inflows from the sheet. Um, this is sort of a detail, but you can see it start to rotate. That happens because uh, centrifugal force from the rotation needs to balance out the gravitational infall. Um, as the structure develops, you can see that by the end of the simulation, what we have is a new rapidly rotating galaxy, which is formed out of the gas cloud. So gravitational instability can um, convert a cloud of gas with almost no structure into something as structured as a galaxy. The same principle is true on larger scales. Here's a computer simulation of a region of the universe which is several million light years in size, uh, starting about 50 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, we now believe with modern data, and I'll say later how we know this, that the early universe, 50 million years af after the Big Bang, contains almost no initial structure. So the only sense in which this gas is structured is that uh, there are variations in density on the order of 1% from one place to another. Uh, when I start the movie, uh, not much happens at first, but the initial structure is slowly growing by gravitational instability. The motion that you see here, by the way, is the camera moving, not the gas moving. Uh, with time, the gas collects into filaments and you can see galaxies start to form. This is on a much larger scale, so the galaxies are much smaller than the um, simulation box. Uh, the next level of structure which develops is that the galaxies start to merge together. If you look closely, you can see in the filaments the galaxies moving together. Uh, large galaxies are formed through a process of gravitational instability, where small ones merge together mostly along filaments to make large ones. Um, this structure of filaments, by the way, is called the cosmic web. And so on the largest scales of the universe, we can convert a nearly structureless universe into the rich array of galaxies and structure that we see today. Uh, now this cone is showing the evolution of the universe by gravitational instability over time. The cone shape is supposed to remind you that the universe is expanding. Uh, I want to talk about the Dark Ages, which is the initial period before the formation of stars and galaxies, when the universe is full of a nearly uniform gas, which is slowly growing structure through gravitational collapse. Uh, now, a property of a gas in an expanding universe is that as the universe expands, the gas cools. 
Uh, you've experienced a version of this if you've felt the cold air from an aerosol can. Uh, gas, the can is under, gas in the can is under pressure, so when you, um, when you release it, it expands, and gas is cool when they expand. Uh, the same is true uh, when the universe expands. So uh, if at a certain time, say 10 million years after the Big Bang, the gas filling the universe has a temperature of, say, 80 Celsius, then if we run the clock backwards, you'll see in a sec why I want to, why I want to run it backwards, uh, then 5 million years after the Big Bang, it would be at a higher temperature, 300 Celsius, 1500 Celsius, and so on. Uh, when, we reach, when we reach a critical temperature, namely 3000 Celsius, uh, something interesting happens. The gas disassociates into a plasma. Um, when I say gas, what I mean is a gas made of atoms, i.e. Uh, electrons bound to nuclei, uh, and a plasma is just a different kind of gas, really, where the uh, electrons are so hot that they've disassociated from the nuclei, and you just have a gas of the constituent uh, unbound nuclei and electrons. Um, the sun is an example of a plasma. Most of the, almost all the material in the sun is in this plasma state. Uh, so we can predict that Early in the universe's um, history, the age, the, the age where this happens is about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, that the universe was, it was full of uh, matter in its plasma state, not a gas. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about a plasma is that it's opaque, unlike a gas, which is transparent, suggesting the possibility that we could look back and see it. Um, so if we could look far enough, we might see something like this. Uh, Close to us, we have the galaxies. Uh, if we look out a little further, we see the dark ages. And then we should see a wall. If this picture is correct, we should literally see a wall encircling the Earth of opaque plasma. Uh, you can see how far one can go just by following the implications of the, of the expanding universe to their logical conclusion, running back the clock. To look for the plasma in the sky, we need to know uh, what color it is. Of course, I mean color in the astronomer's sense, where we think about the whole electromagnetic spectrum, of which our visible set of colors is a narrow subset. Uh, because we know the temperature of the plasma, we know we're looking for the plasma surface at a temperature of 3,000 Celsius. It's possible to calculate from atomic physics what color we would expect to see. And you, when you do this, you get a color that turns out to be in the short wave infrared part of the spectrum, a little bit redder than visible. Uh, but because this light was emitted a long time ago, there's a very large Doppler redshift, so that that same light observed now should be in the microwave part of the spectrum. So we're looking for a big microwave-colored wall uh, very far away in space, way past the galaxies and everything else. Uh, the light that I'm talking about has a name. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background. Um, and it was uh, observed in 1965 by these guys, Penzias and Wilson. Uh, so these guys were uh, non-physicists. They were radio engineers. Uh, they were doing some communications work. And uh, they, didn't, they, they found the Cosmic Microwave Background by accident. They had, they had built this big antenna. And they discovered that they were getting a signal, no matter what they did, where it whether it was day or night, wherever they pointed it on the sky. Um, these guys, I think, get kind of sometimes a bad rap in the history books because they found something you know, really fantastic, but they found it sort of by accident. But uh, I think it's uh, kind of to their credit, if you read their account, uh, the tremendous care that they took in ruling out alternative explanations until they were forced to conclude that the sky was bright everywhere, everywhere in microwaves. Um, for a while, they had like a bird poop theory that their signal was due to birds pooping in this thing, and they uh, like cleaned it out carefully and like bought shotguns and ran the birds off. It's really entertaining to read their account. Uh, anyway, when all was said and done, they had discovered the following. Uh, if I were to show you an image of the sky in, at visible wavelengths of light, this would look sort of familiar. You can see bright stars. Uh, this is the plane of our galaxy. This is the Milky Way. Um, the galactic center here is bright. There's some dust clouds that are obscuring things in different places. Uh, if your eyes could see in the microwave part of the spectrum, then you would see this sky. Uh, it's light all the time and featureless. Most of the light in the universe, by the way, is in the microwave. In a statistical sense, the universe is microwave colored. 
And what you're seeing is back to, you're looking all the way back to the wall of plasma surrounding the Earth from when um, the universe was only 400,000 years old. Um, now, we can't see any further than this because the plasma is opaque. But if we could, uh, what would you see? Well, the surface of the plasma is 3,000 Celsius. And if we look further back, we're looking a little bit further back in time. Uh, the temperature goes up as, as you go backward in time. So a little bit further back, you would, you would, there would be a plasma that was 4,000 Celsius, 5,000, and so on. And in fact, when you do the calculation, you find that you reach infinite temperature a finite distance away. This is the Big Bang problem that we found before. Uh, the distance is actually very close to the plasma surface itself. So if you could look just a little bit further, uh, you would reach a point where the plasma had a predicted infinite temperature. Uh, what that, of course, really means is that our predictivity has failed. We don't know the correct laws of physics that would, that would allow us to predict what you would see if you could look a little bit further. But uh, you can't because the surface is opaque and uh, blocks out the light. But if you could, we're very close to reaching a uh, disaster. Uh, now I want to pause and make a few comments on this picture, which are very important. I found that when I teach cosmology to people who are still learning, um, there's a few potential misunderstandings in this picture, which, al which always cause confusion later. Uh, so one comment is that it looks like the Earth, is, the Earth is at the center here and that the character of the universe is changing uh, as you go from place to place. Uh, what's really happening is that the universe is the same everywhere, but you're looking um, back in time. Uh, so, it's, so it's not that you're looking out in space to a place where the universe is different, it's just that you're looking back in time to a time when the universe was a plasma. If you were to take a snapshot of the whole universe today, it would all look the same. It would all be full of galaxies out to the edges of the figure. If you were to take a snapshot of the universe at an in, uh, take a snapshot of the whole universe at the same time, during the dark ages, it would all look dark. Uh, and during the time when the universe was a plasma, it would, it, the whole universe would look like a uniform plasma. Uh, so there's no preferred center. And an observer that was sitting here, for example, would see the same picture, the same picture just shifted over to, so that it's centered at their location. Uh, Another thing that is suggested by this plot is that the universe is somehow finite. Um, and that is true in a practical observational sense. The furthest away that we can ever look, at least with light, is to, is to uh, this plasma surface. And in fact, if we could look a little bit farther, we would really get into trouble. Our equations wouldn't predict what we could see anymore. So there's a finite amount that we can ever observe. <coughs> but as far as we know, the universe is, in fact, is infinite, uh, or at least it's so large we can't distinguish it observationally from an infinite universe. We believe that if you could, you know, if you could take a snapshot today and keep going, it would look the same well past the edges of the screen. Uh, okay, so this is a picture uh, of the expanding universe. Uh, now I'm going to show you some modern measurements of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so these images are all from two very influential satellite experiments, the WMAP satellite, which is a NASA-led mission, and the Planck satellite, which is a European ESA mission. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be on both of, to take part in both of these experiments. Um, <coughs> so the way these experiments work uh, is that the satellite uh, goes out. It takes about six months to travel very far from the Earth so that it's in a very stable thermal environment and cool down to reach a nice state of thermal equilibrium. Um, and then it has a beam that scans the sky with very sensitive uh, detectors. When this is done, what's revealed is that the microwave background isn't perfectly uniform, as I showed at all, but contains features at very low contrast. Uh, these features are measured across the whole sky, and we make a map of the microwave sky zoomed in to very high contrast, which looks like this. Uh, now this is what the raw data looks like from the instrument. Uh, this is mostly, mostly what you're seeing here is dust emission in the microwave part of the spectrum, but from our galaxy. Um, if we separate that out, if we subtract the, con the contribution from our galaxy, which we can do because um, 
dust and the cosmic microwave background, the light from the plasma surface, have different frequency dependence or colors, uh, then you get a picture like this, which represents the thermal state of the plasma surface itself. Uh, what this means is that the plasma surface has regions which are slightly hotter, where the radiation is slightly more intense, or in regions where the radiation is slightly less intense. These are very low contrast features. The difference between the intensity in the hottest point in the map and the coldest point in the map, uh, they differ only at the fourth decimal place. Uh, so earlier I said that the universe starts out with almost no structure, and the way we know that's true is because we can take the snapshot of the universe 100,000 years after the Big Bang when the universe is a plasma, and we see that conditions from place to place in the universe only differ in the fourth decimal place. Uh, so if you were around in the early universe, you would see you, you would live in a nearly uniform hot plasma with almost no structure. The only sense in which there's structure is that if you traveled tens of millions of light years away, you would see a plasma with a temperature that was slightly different in the fourth decimal place. Uh, now the modern um, theory of how we get from then to now works like this. Uh, the first thing that happens is that the plasma cools down to a gas and the universe becomes transparent. And then gravitational instability starts to work its magic and magnify tiny structures that were present in the plasma. We go through the dark ages and the first stars form. Uh, and then the cosmic web and the galaxies. So a tiny feature in the cosmic microwave background what looks like a tiny spot in one of these microwave background maps might be the seed for, say, a cluster of galaxies today after gravitational instability happens. But the real power of the cosmic microwave background, the real excitement, is that we can do a kind of cosmic fingerprinting. Uh, so the statistics of the um, spots in the CMB uh, are very sensitive to the characteristic properties of the universe, so they can be a cosmic fingerprint that identifies our universe out of many theoretical possibilities. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, how old is the universe? This, I think, is a very natural question to ask. Uh, Hubble tried to measure the age of the universe and got two billion years. Uh, Einstein, very famously, was very attached to the idea that the, university, that the universe was infinitely old. Um, of course, uh, you know, philosophers and, uh, and uh, in religion, there's been a lot of speculation on this question. Uh, so it's amazing, I find it truly amazing that with modern CMB data, we can make the following statement. Uh, with 95% statistical confidence, the age of the universe is greater than 13.68 billion years and less than 13.92 billion years. Uh, now I want to give you some idea of how this analysis is actually done. Uh, so the next few slides are going to be a little technical, but when I say that this number or that number, like the age of the universe, is measured from the CMB, I want to give some idea of how we actually conduct that measurement. Uh, so I want to start with this analogy. Uh, you've probably seen spectral analysis of sound in graphic equalizer format. So this range represents the range of frequencies or pitches which is hearable by the human ear with the low end or bass on the right and the high or treble end, sorry, the lower bass end on the left and the higher treble end on the right. And now if I play a low tone, that shows up mainly on the low end of the spectrum. Uh, if I play a middle tone, you can see a single peak in the middle. And if I play a natural tone, like a violin, that might have multiple peaks or some interesting shape in its constituent frequencies that tells you something about the instrument that made it. We can do an analogous sort of spectral analysis of the hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background. Here what the axis means, the axis corresponds to features in this map of different apparent size in degrees. So we go through the map, well, a computer goes through the map, and says, here's a feature that's one degree in size, I'll put it down here. Uh, here's a feature that's a tenth of a degree in size, I'll put it out here. And then we add them all up and get this rather interesting curve. And if I had more time, I'd love to tell you about the plasma physics that generates this shape. Uh, that shows that, for example, that there are a lot of features at about a degree, l fewer features at this scale, which is, say, half a degree, and so on. Uh, so this analysis distills the information in this map down into a curve. Uh, now we can predict this curve 
Uh, so the curve that I showed you, the curve that I showed you, by the way, was actually a fit to um, modern measurements of the cosmic microwave background, not the measurements themselves. But the accuracy of the measurements is comparable to the thickness of the line, so it, doesn't re it wouldn't really look that different if I showed you the measurements. Uh, we can calculate this curve, uh, and, and it depends on the age of the universe. If we, uh, could, if we um, use the universe with age 14.8 billion years instead of 13.8 billion years, we would get a different curve that disagrees with the measurements. Uh, so in this way, um, we can measure with statistical errors the age of the universe um, and other characteristic properties, the composition, the total star formation that's happened in our universe, and so on. Um, when we do this, we find that there are some things that are unsurprising, like there's nothing you know, particularly surprising a priori about this number, um, but we also find that there are basic aspects of our universe that were total surprises when discovered that we don't fully understand. And uh, this is what I want to tell you in the last part of the talk. Uh, so, so far I've been telling you about things that we understand pretty well, and uh, now I want to tell you about some surprises that we've uncovered that we don't fully understand yet. So I would say that, broadly speaking, almost every cosmologist is thinking about one of three fundamental mysteries. Uh, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? And what is the physics of the, of the very beginning? So I'm going to tell you about each of these. Um, starting with dark matter. Uh, so, as you know, ordinary matter is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, surprisingly, we have learned that the universe at large is mostly made of something else. There's about five times more dark matter in the universe than the ordinary proton, neutron, electron-based matter that we're familiar with. Uh, now, uh, it would be natural to follow this sentence by a statement of, about what dark matter is. I can't do that because no one knows, but I can tell you the properties that we do know. Uh, first off, it doesn't absorb, reflect, or emit light. It has no interaction with light. Uh, so a better name than dark matter, actually, I think a more illustrative name would be transparent matter. That's the proper term for matter that doesn't interact with light. Uh, it doesn't interact with ordinary matter, it just goes right through it. Uh, there are dark matter particles streaming through this room right now, through the walls, through the earth. Um, what it does do, the way that we can know it's there, is it gravitates. So ordinary matter and dark matter attract each other and themselves gravitationally, so we can observe dark matter through its indirect effect on ordinary luminous matter that we see directly. Dark matter has a large effect, for example, on the formation of galaxies. Here's a computer simulation of a cluster of galaxies. Red is dark matter, white is ordinary matter. Uh, you can see that the dark matter, gravitational instability has aggregated the dark matter into little blobs, which we call dark matter halos, and the galaxies are smaller objects that live inside those halos. In fact, the dark matter halos form first, and create the proper conditions for galaxies to form. So dark matter plays a very crucial role by forming halos uh, in the modern theory of, gra of galaxy formation. Uh, now, if you're a skeptical person like me, you're probably thinking this is a lot to swallow. Uh, how do we really know that the universe is full of invisible dark matter that we can't see directly? Uh, well, the first observational evidence uh, came from observations of rotations of galaxies. Uh, so the rate at which different parts of a galaxy rotate is related to the distribution of matter in the galaxy. Um, so if we assume that the matter in the stars of the galaxy was all that there was, then we would predict a certain type of rotation shown here on the left, where the arms of the galaxy rotate relatively slowly and the center rotates quickly because there's not much matter out here in the arms. But if the galaxy sits in a dark matter halo, then there's matter everywhere, um, and the, the halo is heavier than the galaxy itself, uh, so the Matter is roughly uniformly distributed, and the uh, arms rotate quickly, as does the center. And uh, this matches what's actually observed. Uh, now, I would say that on its own, this is fairly inconclusive evidence for dark matter. Uh, I'm not sure that if I had been around in 1970 when this was first being discussed, I would have found this hypothesis, the dark matter hypothesis, fully convincing. Uh, one could imagine alternative hypotheses, like maybe the outer parts of the galaxy are just full of gas that for some reason hasn't formed stars yet, but is still contributing to the mass. Uh, but what happened is that when the dark matter hypothesis was formulated, uh, astronomers found that it explained a lot of different types of observations. For example, nowadays we have really overwhelming evidence. Uh, the cosmic microwave background power spectrum uh, 
the standard prediction, which agrees with the data, is calculated assuming about five times more dark matter than ordinary matter. And uh, I tried just for fun to see how well I could do at matching it without uh, including dark matter in the calculation. And this is the best I could do. It's wildly different. It's a very, you know, an overwhelmingly poor fit to the data. Uh, there are many other lines of evidence nowadays. The shapes and sizes of galaxies that we see, we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to get the galaxy formation right and so on. And now, nowadays, about 10 different types of evidence, lines of evidence, that are all simultaneously explained by the dark matter hypothesis. So this is the hallmark of a successful theory, that a, that a simple hypothesis proposed to explain one thing, rotation rates of galaxies, actually explains a lot of unrelated phenomena. And this has convinced almost every cosmologist, including me, that the dark matter hypothesis has to be correct. Uh, but we don't know what dark matter is on a microscopic level. We've never been able to make it in the lab or a particle accelerator. Um, so its existence is kind of a fundamental puzzle. Uh, next, I want to talk about dark energy. So even though the names dark matter and dark energy are very similar, they actually refer to two quite distinct phenomena. So, Dark energy refers to the following phenomenon. Um, Einstein's theory of relativity makes a prediction for the expansion rate of the universe as a function of time. And what it predicts is a slowing expansion, as shown in the bottom part of the plot. When we measure the expansion rate with time, what we find is that it agrees pretty well with the prediction, it agrees well with the prediction of uh, Einstein's relativity for the first eight billion years or so. And then it switches over at recent times to a totally different accelerating type of expansion. Um, so dark energy is a catch-all term for whatever unknown physics is causing the measured expansion of the universe to deviate from the prediction. Uh, now, one explanation that's been put forward, and this I would say is sort of the orthodox front-runner explanation, but it's by no means established conclusively, is that if you um, were to modify Einstein's theory of gravity by allowing the vacuum, uh, you know, for empty space itself, to have a slightly non-zero energy density um, that is included as a source in Einstein's equations to drive the expansion of the universe. So you say, the universe expands as if the vacuum itself were full of a very tiny but non-zero distribution of matter. Uh, the difference between this uh, explanation, the vacuum energy density being non-zero, and the universe being full of, say, dark matter, is that dark matter dilutes with time. As the universe expands, the dark matter particles get farther and farther away from each other and dilute, uh, but if the vacuum is assumed to have a non-zero energy density, then as the universe expands, you just generate more and more vacuum. Uh, so this is why we see this, um, this effect small for a while, but then take over at recent times when the universe gets big enough. Um, so that's one possibility, and this, this um, theory uh, predicts a uh, specific dependence of the expansion rate with time, uh, which is roughly what we see in the, at, in the data, but the data is not great. So this is not established. This explanation is consistent with the data, but I would not say that the data is good enough that it's conclusive. Um, and then there are many other possibilities. One thing that may be happening is that maybe our theory of gravity is incomplete. I mean, Einstein's theory of gravity made a prediction and we measure something different. Maybe that just means that the theory of gravity is just, this is telling us that, that Einstein's theory of gravity is incomplete in some more fundamental way that we haven't quite been able to think of yet. Uh, or maybe there's another source of gravitation in the universe that we don't quite understand yet. It would have to be something kind of exotic, like a fluid with negative pressure, but something like that might work. Uh, a natural question to ask is, how will the universe end? Uh, dark energy qualitatively changes that answer. Since we live in a universe where an accelerating expansion is suddenly taking over, uh, if you extrapolate our universe far into the future, what will happen is you just get a more and more rapid expansion, an exponential expansion, in fact, so that if you wait 10 billion years, every galaxy is twice as far from us as it was today, another 10 billion years, four times as far, and so on. So the universe just dilutes with galaxies with time, the CMB dims out, and eventually you live in kind of a cold, lonely universe where you have no neighbors. Uh, that's our current extrapolation of what we measure. 
Um, a little depressing. <laughs> another, na another natural question to ask is what is the universe composed of? So the dark matter and dark energy phenomena show a very surprising answer to this question. Um, there's more dark matter in the universe than there is ordinary matter, and at least if the cosmological constant is correct, the explanation is correct, what dark energy means is that there's a bunch of density, matter, or, or equivalently energy in the universe associated with the vacuum that represents an even larger fraction. Uh, so the ordinary matter that we're familiar with that make up the Earth, the Sun, and so on is only 5% of the total composition of the universe, which is uh, sort of a shocking statement. Um, so we, we don't live in a special place in the universe. We do live in a special place in time. And I think more profoundly, the stuff that we're familiar with, the matter that we're familiar with, is not representative of the universe at large. Statistically speaking, most of the universe is made of something else. Um, that's kind of a surprising thing to find. Uh, Next, I want to talk about something which I personally just find incredibly interesting. This is like my favorite topic, uh, the physics of the very beginning. Uh, our universe has a big bang. Uh, what that means is that if we looked out, we would expect to see a plasma with higher and higher temperatures until we reached an infinite temperature at a finite radius, and we do not know the laws of physics to keep predicting. So we'd like to... Uh, uh, understand what's happening here, properly understand the Big Bang, and fill in the question marks. Uh, now, if the surface of the plasma is a 3,000 degree plasma, which is sort of like the conditions of a star, then if you imagine going out so that you go you know, to higher and higher temperature, uh, eventually you reach um, a situation where the temperature is so high, say trillions of degrees, that the uh, Particles in the plasma are crashing together at very high energy. Now, there's a principle in physics that uh, as you go to higher and higher energies, new types of particles are created and new types of physics emerge. Like, you've probably heard about particle, particle accelerator experiments, like the Large Hadron Collider. The idea is you just smash stuff together at higher and higher energies and new interesting stuff comes out. So the problem that we're trying to solve here of understanding the Big Bang Maybe because as we go back, the universe becomes more and more like a giant particle accelerator. Maybe fundamentally the same problem that particle physicists are trying to solve. Uh, what is the physics? What are the laws of physics at very high energies? And so the answer may have something to do with new particles or forces that we don't know about yet. Uh, another possible clue comes from statistical study of the features in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, it turns out that the statistics of the hot and cold spots at, say, this part of the plasma surface are correlated to the features over here. In other words, the, the distribution of features here, for those features to arrange themselves, they would have to know what the features over here were doing. Since these points are separated by tremendous distances in space, this suggests some sort of common origin to all of the perturbations in the universe. It's as if some you know, omnipotent agent with access to information about what the perturbations in different parts of the universe was doing was responsible for setting the initial conditions. Uh, there are also some more technical clues that, observe, that result from statistical analysis of these fluctuations, like uh, the temperature values fit um, a bell curve um, very precisely to um, a fraction of a percent um, when plotted. Um, now, for a long time, we had no successful theory that would explain these features. But in 1982, there was a breakthrough. A remarkable theory was proposed, inflation, which explains all of the um, statements that I just made. Uh, so the way inflation works is like this. Uh, suppose that the early universe is full of one or more new types of particle, and uh, that it, it, if these... if these new types of particles satisfy certain conditions, they will drive a phase of exponential expansion in the early universe. So after some amount of time, which the times that people talk about are very small, like 10 to the minus 40 seconds, the universe doubles in size after the same amount of time, four times the size, eight times the size, and so on. Then uh, a remarkable thing happens in an exponentially expanding universe. Particles are produced by a quantum mechanical mechanism. Uh, generally speaking, in quantum mechanics, there are processes where two particles, in quantum mechanics, you're allowed to produce two particles out of the vacuum from empty space. 
Uh, now, normally what happens is that the two particles quickly re-annihilate so that the um, books are balanced, so to speak, and no net particles are produced. Uh, but we do know, in order to explain, for example, very accurate measurements of spectral lines of atoms in very um, accurate quantum mechanical calculations, you do need to include these sort of processes. Uh, so we know that they happen. Um, if you calculate what happens in this exponentially expanding universe, what can happen is that a particle pair gets created, but then this very rapid exponential expansion carries the two particles very far away from each other so that they can't find each other again to re-annihilate. So quantum mechanics in this, exponentially, in this rapidly exponentially expansion, expanding um, universe uh, randomly creates particles uh, and, in fact, um, can generate fluctuations out of empty space. Because, it's a, because this process of particle creation is a random process, there'll be random fluctuations in the amount of particles that are produced here versus here. This is, so this can explain how the initial hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background are created. Um, gravitational instability can transform the initial hot and cold spots in the plasma into the structures that we see today but out of gravitational instability, you can't get something from nothing. If I started with no fluctuations, gravitational instability would never generate them. But quantum, in quantum mechanics, you can get something from nothing. By this mechanism, you can start with an empty universe, if it's exponentially expanding, and produce random fluctuations. And the miracle of this theory, inflation, is that when you do the calculations, you find exactly the right statistical properties that we see in the CMB. The correlation that I talked about between different parts of the plasma surface, the bell curve, and so on, can all be matched to within the accuracy of the observations. Um, so if inflation is correct, here's the picture. What we, um, the circle that we drew as the Big Bang before represents the point in time where the universe made a transition from a quantum mechanical exponentially expanding universe to a hot plasma. Before this, so something does happen there, but it's not a disaster. The laws of physics are not breaking down. Before that, we just had an exponentially expanding uh, quantum mechanical universe where particles were constantly being produced, creating the initial fluctuations. Uh, so this is a totally amazing theory. Before 1982, we didn't have anything like this. In 1982, we had a theory that worked. Um, here's the problem. Uh, that since then, we found many more theories that also do the job. Uh, so maybe it's not such a miracle that inflation works, but some sort of general feature that can happen in many different ways. What's true in all of these theories is that this circle, this point in time, represents some sort of transition from a quantum mechanical universe to a hot plasma. Um, and before this, you had a universe that was quantum mechanical in nature and very different. Uh, so the problem that we're trying to solve now is to move forward and discriminate between these different possibilities. And in order to do that, we need more clues from observations. Um, so here's a particular type of observation that has been in the news recently. Uh, so some flavors of inflation make the, make the following prediction. During the inflationary universe, in addition to hot and cold spots in the plasma being created, a random background of gravity waves was also created. Um, so gravity waves are propagating disturbances in space-time that are predicted uh, by Einstein's theory of general relativity, it, or at least it predicts that such a disturbance is possible. Uh, and we can look for these in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, we can look for them even though they were generated um, before um, the plasma surface. The plasma surface is opaque to light, so we can't look further, but a gravity wave goes right through. Uh, the plasma is perfectly transparent to gravity waves, so if this signal exists, there's the possibility of looking all the way back through the plasma surface and seeing a signal that originated um, during the Big Bang itself that is propagated relatively undisturbed until today. So this would be truly amazing to see. It would be truly amazing to predict this thing and see it in the sky today. Uh, in March 2014, uh, an analysis of current data in cosmology suggested that the signal had been detected. Um, but if you follow the story, uh, over time, well, by May, uh, some loopholes had been found in this argument, and the answer was maybe. 
Uh, and then on January 30th, which was five days ago, <laughs> the answer was conclusively determined to be no. <laughs> so this is our current um, best um, understanding, uh, our, our current understanding of um, the combined data of the cosmic microwave background from several sources. Uh, and uh, of course, what's really exciting about this for a researcher is that this was happening, this is all happening right now. Uh, so we've gone from, at the beginning of the talk, 1929 to five days ago. Uh, the exciting thing is that uh, the observations are getting much better, and we're constantly getting new data, and the picture is constantly evolving with time. Uh, so I want to tell you about a particularly exciting project that I'm involved in uh, right here in Canada. Uh, so the project is called CHIME. Uh, it's the first Canadian research telescope in more than 30 years, uh, and it's in um, Penticton, BC, which is just underneath the sockeye salmon. Uh, Chime is this pair of telescopes in front. The guy in back is a uh, different project. Uh, these are radio telescopes. They look for light at radio wavelengths. Uh, this mesh uh, has a spacing which is much smaller than the wavelength of radio waves. So the radio waves bounce off as if it was a solid surface and collect. They're focused by the telescope up into this feed line, which is instrumented with a series of antennas. The antennas are connected to some incredibly powerful back-end electronics. So this little electronics house in Penticton, BC, by the time the project is finished, will um, be one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world uh, and will process data at a total bandwidth equivalent to a large telecommunications network. And what we're looking for is the following. Uh, so it turns out that the dark ages are not completely dark. The hydrogen that fills the universe during the, during the dark ages is faintly emitting radio waves. Um, so we could coin the term almost dark ages, which is not a standard term, to refer to the situation where there's just very faint, um, uh, very faint emission from the neutral hydrogen filling the universe. Uh, we're trying to measure this radiation uh, Chime is looking sort of here, right at the edge of where the galaxies start to fizzle out and the dark ages start. Uh, what we'd eventually like to do is map out uh, all of the dark ages. And this won't be possible with Chime alone. We'll need many generations of experiments. Chime is just the first step. Uh, but if we could do it, then the total statistical power of all of these fluctuations um, is much greater than the total statistical power in the cosmic microwave background, which is living here on the plasma surface. Um, that's sort of true because there's much more information in a 3D field than a 2D field. Uh, so if we could make this measurement uh, in the future, in the far future, we may be able to massively improve our current um, picture of cosmology. We're still a long way today, I would say, from the ultimate limits of what we might hope to measure someday. Uh, okay. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we live in an expanding universe full of strange stuff. Uh, even the matter that we're composed of is not representative of the universe at large. Uh, we don't live in a special place in space, but we do live in a special place in time. Uh, midway between the Big Bang, when the universe is a plasma, and when the universe is eventually just in exponentially diluted by dark energy. Uh, there's some things we understand and some things we don't. If we postulate certain ingredients, dark matter, dark energy, and a quantum mechanical Big Bang, then starting from those postulates, we can understand uh, the observations that we currently see, but we don't understand these ingredients at a fundamental level. We don't know what dark matter is or dark energy conclusively, uh, and there are many possibilities for what may have been happening around the Big Bang. Um, What's really exciting is that we're living in a time where the, all of the um, experiments are improving incredibly fast, and it's really, it's really exciting to be part of such a fast-paced field. Um, so if a thousand years ago your picture of the universe looked like this, uh, and a hundred years ago it looked like this, uh, then now uh, this is the modern picture, uh, and now you know what it means. Uh, it's a much stranger place, I would say, than the picture from a hundred years ago, and we're still trying to understand it. The current state of the field is an avalanche of new data and theoretical ideas aimed at understanding the puzzles that we see here. And if I give this talk again in another 20 or 30 years, uh, our picture may be totally different. Uh, 
Thanks. Terrific. Well, we'll open the floor to questions. There's a microphone right here for those of you in the in-studio audience. And as you make your way to the uh, microphone, let's go to the Twitter feed. And I have a question here from the Twitter feed, and it's, this might be a tough one to start with. What happened before the Big Bang to cause the universe to emerge? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, let me go back. Um, to this picture. Uh, so the Big Bang can mean, when people use the term Big Bang, they can mean one of two things. One is this circle, which is sometimes called the hot Big Bang to disambiguate, uh, where the universe transitions from its quantum mechanical phase to its hot plasma phase. Uh, sometimes people use the term Big Bang to mean the earliest time that we don't understand. So it uh, doesn't actually refer to a specific event in the universe, it just refers to uh, a specific um, limitation of our understanding. Uh, and so I think it's hard to say, so it may be, we don't currently understand exactly what's happening in the quantum mechanical universe. Uh, we believe, because these miraculous calculations work, that there probably is some sort of hot Big Bang transition from a quantum mechanical universe to a plasma universe. Um, but we don't really understand the nature of the quantum mechanical universe. Uh, it may be that when we do, that, this, that we find another circle even further out. Maybe we'll find that the quantum mechanical universe, in order to get it to work, maybe it had to come from something else. And then we'll, our answer to one question will raise the new question. Uh, but it's difficult to predict until we really know what's out here. Thank you. Let's go to the in-studio. Uh, great talk and uh, an awesome first question, whoever submitted that, <laughs> I enjoyed it. Um, you said that, you, you've said several times that we live at a special time in the evolution of our universe. Um, isn't that just an expression of the weak anthropic principle? Isn't this just a special time for us, for life as we know it? Um, oh, sure. Uh, I mean, given that the universe evolves in time, uh, there's nothing surprising about the fact that we live in the window of time that's hospitable for life. Um, I mean, if you go back far enough, say, to when the universe was a plasma, then everything was too hot to form life. And if we wait long enough, then we'll burn out all the material and stars that we need to form new stars, and we'll exponentially dilute from dark energy-dominated expansion, and the universe will be sort of a cold, dead place, also inhospitable for life. Um, I think that's what you're asking, right? That, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe in the quantum mechanical universe there are quantum mechanical life forms and in the almost dark ages there are almost dark ages life forms, or potentially anyway, and that in a, what we would consider to be a heat death universe, there are life forms feeding off the energy fluctuations of that time. Um, uh... Perhaps that's more of a biology question than a physics question. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to speculate on uh, all the possible ways that life might have happened, given, given that we only know of one way that it did happen. Um, I mean, I personally find it hard to imagine that if we went back very far, say, um, when the universe was a plasma, or when the universe was just a gas and uh, stars hadn't formed, that there would really be enough complexity there would just be enough scope for life. Um, it also seems sort of implausible to me that, you know, if we wait long enough, um, then the universe reaches a state of, of thermal equilibrium um, where there just aren't enough fluctuations around to seed life. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to the Twitter feed. There's lots of questions here. Um, the question is this. Just as we have wimps as dark matter candidates, is there speculation about the source of dark energy? Oh, yeah. Uh, that is a matter of tremendous speculation. Uh, there are, um, you know, many general classes of um, hypotheses for what dark energy might be. 
Uh, the leading explanation, or at least um, the most popular one, leading is kind of a loaded word. Uh, I mean, uh, most popular is probably the most accurate thing to say. It just reflects um, the aesthetic judgment of physicists. Uh, but uh, the sort of orthodox explanation that everyone compares to is the cosmological constant explanation, where the vacuum has a non-zero energy density. Um, and then there are many different categories of alternative hypotheses. Uh, one is that there's something different about um, gravity, that gravity maybe contains more fields than the ones that we know about. Um, there are explanations where you postulate um, new fields which are sources of matter or gravity in the universe, like fluids that fill the universe. Um, those, I would say, are the main categories of alternative hypothesis. Terrific. Well, and let's finish with this one last question. And again, it's kind of a tough one. Uh, how will the universe end? Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, it depends on what time scale you ask the question. Uh, let me, I talked about it a little bit in my talk, but since I have a little time to elaborate, uh, we could go through the steps. So uh, the first thing that will happen is that our sun will go, the first thing that will happen to us is that our sun will go supernova in a few billion years. Uh, a little bit after that, uh, Andromeda Galaxy will merge with ours, which is kind of a violent event. It ejects a lot of stars in the system, and those that are left, um, you know, are uh, combined to form one new merged galaxy. Um, when dark energy, so those are events that happen relatively soon, as in only a few billion years. <laughs> After that, we get to the time scales where um, dark energy is operating. And then what happens is that you see an exponential dilution where different galaxies become separated from each other exponentially fast. Uh, now that, it turns out, doesn't unbind structures which are already gravitationally bound. Like our galaxy, for example, would not be torn apart by the dark energy dominated expansion, but two galaxies that were reasonably separated from each other would eventually find themselves um, exponentially separated. Um, eventually what happens in the very, very extreme far future is that the cosmic microwave background um, dims out and the whole universe fills in the ultimate far future limit of a, of a dark energy dominated expansion. The whole universe fills with thermal radiation, which is produced by the same quantum mechanical mechanism that, that produces particles during inflation. Um, the ultimate far future limit of a dark energy dominated expansion is mathematically similar to the ultimate early time limit of inflation. Thank you. And there's one more in-house studio question, so let's take that. Oh, we, you speak about the fact that <clears throat> we tend to disprove earlier theories and find new ways of looking at things. I recall an article last summer in the Globe and Mail about the God particle and something that I had to write down, which I found intriguing, and it's the Groucho Marx effect, which says that physics, in physics, any universe simple enough to be understood is too simple to produce a mind capable of understanding it. <laughs> so... <laughs> The question is, at what point do we feel that we've arrived, or do uh, we reach there? <laughs> that's a fun question. <laughs> so, uh, it may be that um, we reach some... Um, physicists like to talk about maybe finding some ultimate theory um, that explains everything, and we'll be all done with physics, or at least fundamental physics. We'll know all the laws of physics, um, and, uh, you know, then we'll spend forever working out the consequences. Um, that's, uh, that's one possibility. Or it may be, you know, what's happened so far is that every time we extend the laws of physics, we just find new puzzles. We, th we find that things aren't quite complete or we find new phenomena that we didn't know are there. So it may be like peeling back the layers of, the, of an onion where every time we solve one set of puzzles, there's another, puzzle, another set of puzzles underneath. Um, there's no way to really know in advance. You just have to keep uh, exploring. Terrific. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kendrick Smith.